team today. I'd also like to welcome uh, Sarah Brennan from CPC, who's observing today, leaving our relationship manager. So, welcome, Sarah. It's good to, to have you here uh, with us. With regards to um, apologies, I have one apology, which is from um, Thomas Kearney, who is our new non executive director. He started this week, he did his induction this week uh, in person, but this day, He'd already got prior commitments, so he was unable to attend. But you will see him either at board members at committee meetings or at the next board meeting where I can formally um, introduce him and welcome him to our trust. Um, that's great. I don't think there's any other apologies. No apologies. Brilliant. Um, and so if we go to the minutes from the last meeting, rather than me to scroll through every page, are there any points of accuracy or omissions or people want to draw our attention to in relation to the minutes? No. Okay, so we can uh, accept the minutes as a true reflection if that took place. And if we go to the matters arising as well. No, at the bottom of the minutes. Oh, at the bottom. It's the new way, but at the bottom of the minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. They are completed so that was the finance report in terms of additional information and run rate. And also the patient safety experience report that was completed as well. This is, this is, uh, thank you. For reminding us that the uh, matters arising in our bottom of the minutes. It's the new way we've got a new company secretary, and she's just kind of changed the order around <laughs> slightly a little bit, so she's kind of put, keeping us on our toes. But um, that's great. Thank you. There isn't any matters arising from the meeting held in the of October. So if we move to the Bath the Board Shorts framework, which is um, David, can you please do that? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, it's important for us to know that. Um, the bank also serves as well. It is a critical tool that the board uses in terms of deriving assurance around some of the things that are being done as well, and especially around the management of strategic risks, which are linked to the organizational strategic objectives. It's very important that uh, the board uses the bank to interrogate and to assure themselves or itself that the trust has systems and processes in place for effectively managing risk. In, an, in a comprehensive, agile, inclusive, enterprise-wide manner, and that the system we have in place, the infrastructure in place for managing risk, is robust and effective. Um, as far as our bank is concerned, it's worth noting that the, the, the board committees at their last meeting um, agreed that we should have a multi, multi stakeholder approach to reviewing and updating the bank, which means that. Uh, it's important for us to pull next together, uh, executive directors and colleagues from <coughs> services, so that we come together as a team and review our, our bus, which is a project we're doing at the moment. So that is being fed through and we'll be returning to the board committees in January with an updated bus. The bus we have at the moment is a reflection of the position we had in September, uh, but it's worth noting that we've also incorporated reflected on the bus. Um, the, uh, the, the risk appetite categories that uh, following the risk appetite framework that was approved uh, by the board, so that was incorporated into, into the refresh bar, um, onto the, onto the, into, into the bar as it is now. And so this bar will be returning to the board in the board in, the, in February when it's go, when it will be refreshed and gone through uh, committees in January. So this is just a, a holding position of the board, as far as I'm and thank you, thank you for that, and, uh, Can I open it for any questions? I've got a couple of points as well. Just to ask. Are there any questions? Just one, just to clarify, in terms of the bar, just noticed um, <coughs> on that, in terms of the risk scoring, they uh, you know, in all of these sort of um, portfolios, some of them are quite high in terms of 12 or 16 and so forth. But then when you look at the bar register, um, we've got mainly amberts and, and, and a few green areas. And I just wanted to clarify whether that is reflective of, of 
where we schooled ourselves as well, that we've got the majority of them are, are out there. Do you think that some of them should be in the area of red? Um, I think the, uh, the list we've got on the border trials at the moment, um, uh, most of them are about 15, uh, 16, 12, which is the reflection of the current uh, residual risk, which is in place at the moment. Yeah. Taking the controls which are already in place, which have been deployed. So this is a reflection of the residual risk. We are also implementing actions as well to enable us to attain the target series for the target risk score is what we have said we may like slightly bigger number, which is a, which is related to the uh, to the risk appetite framework. Yeah. So uh, and but again um, in the review, in the multidisciplinary review as well, mm -hmm. part of the thing that we also consider will be the correct score of the risk mm -hmm. and also to align the risk of, uh, of the correct score of the risk as well with some of the progress that has been made with implementation of the strategy. Because one of the things we're making sure that, that the strategy translates into what we're doing around the border assurance framework. Yeah. So that it drives the conversation around the border assurance framework, it reflects in that, it gets embedded in the border assurance framework, which is what they want to take on that role. Well. Yeah. And I think Val, is it Val? Okay, and she. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add to, to what Dave just said. Certainly so from a, a finance and performance perspective, committee perspective, that's one of the reasons why we, we sort of, well, certainly I and the committee have asked for a review in the back uh, and the, the risk scores. Um, in particular, for the mitigation actions that we've got in place, and we, and we need to be very clear on in terms of what's in our control and what's a, sort of the system risk that's outside of our control, and be very clear in terms of what, what it is that we can influence to actually move things forward. Um, so, so I think when we come back in January, I think we'll have a much sharper view uh, across all of these, uh, these areas, I think. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Barman. It's good to hear that. Yeah, there was some discussion of the risk management group about a month ago about exactly that point. We've got a lot of ones that I think we need to be moderated to understand. So there's a policy that's got where you would put the likelihood Etc. Yeah. I'm not sure we're absolutely there. Mm -hmm. So if you look at them and ask the question, this is the same as that, is that what you're saying? That hadn't been done. So what we did there was just refer it back to the individual to take that view. So I think if anything we are ever states that we've just got to be better at that moderation. And so I think people are helpful. subjectively going into 16 as opposed to look, this is the impact of that. Mm -hmm. The policy does talk about that. There's a danger of everything we can risk, therefore, we're looking to risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and that's what I wanted to get further clarity on in terms of trying to come to the solution. I'm going to have a point Yeah, I was just going to say from the people perspective, uh, I think what David was describing in terms of being clear around where we are on each of the controls and the insurance that we bring into the community. And we have we've been starting to have a conversation to how we have understand the overall picture because it's not just one action that changes the score of the rest of the risk. Mm -hmm. So really thinking about are we diving down the risk, looking at the number of different controls that are sitting under that one risk, given that there are four other people under the people agenda. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why you're seeing that some of them are, are, are under all, all greens, very much around tracking uh, with, with a with real track in terms of the controls that we have. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, and just quickly to add on what Dave was saying to build on that, the risk management group is our, our first meeting. What we've, we've got operational colleagues in there as well, we're trying to make the connection between our whole insurance framework, you know, the risks of they having their divisions from an operational perspective and how that makes that big difference. I think it was the conversation started um, to David came and um, reported to our operational management team as well, just trying to get those connections. So we're getting, you know, grassroots on the ground in services, the connection back to you know, to our risk and how we're showing the board that we actually are driving those risks down. So that works in training as well, and it's, it's good to have them there in the meeting. You know, it's quite difficult to try and articulate what we're trying to do, but separate discussions will then continue around that. Yeah, yeah. So, we, so what we're saying then is come January, we'll have a, a refresh. Yeah, some of those scorings may more than likely shift um, as well. Okay. Thank you.
Yeah, just wanted to make a point that um, the, the risk distribution register has gone to all the committees as well as the committees themselves. Yeah. And that um, outside of here, there has been challenge to some other scoring as well, in a good way, because um, I think, for example, that I just going to call keepers, where we scored some of the, some of the areas as 16, where the challenge back actually from the notes was, was, are you being a bit harsh on yourselves by scoring a size up because we're aware of other things that are happening? And I think we tried to correlate that with, um, and we'll see later on the board agenda, mm -hmm. how we're doing against the business plan. Yes. Which is evidence is yes. where we're actually mitigating some of the scores that we've got in the back. Yes. And I think it's um, come on a lot because um, we're, we're able to have a much more kind of rounded discussion now, I think, in committee meetings where you've got the risks clear and then that's in your mind when you're starting to look at other items in the agenda. That's one thing. I think also to be useful, David, and what others have done is indicated where there's been a bit of movement in the risk score as well. So that this document isn't just that like a you know setting stone, that things move and change based on performance, based on instances that happen, based on external environment as well. I mean a good example of that's probably the finance one, where I think um, last year this time we would have been saying a financial risk was up in the break even, we did break even. Whereas this year, this year <coughs> and like many others are going into a deficit because of pressure on services, because of the cost of living crisis, because the government haven't sorted out yet the um, pay awards for key members of staff. So, uh, so yeah, the back just kind of reflects so. that. Yeah. And that's sorry, that time, I think, is what was particularly in the discretion because you've got, depending on what you say, what the time is, it can be lower than it is. So, certainly around the financials, we need to change that so we do find it. Is it long term, as we just now? It sends out a message. It's just important because the papers actually come to the board and because the back actually uh, reflected such high scores for me just to get further clarity on everything seems to be either a 15 or a 16 is exceptionally high. And then obviously the right rating does just seem to be a slight bit disconnect. But this uh, conversation and clarity here is really helpful. So really looking forward to um, Receiving the updated um, BAF uh, in January in the uh, 20th of February. So, great, thank you for that. Um, so, if we move on to the chair's report, my report, obviously um, you will have had a chance to, to read the report, so I'm not actually um, intending on going through it verbatim, but just pick out a couple of, uh, couple of highlights for me anyway. Um, and so, I just wanted to uh, bring to your attention that I have spent some time visiting um, staff across the different trust sites uh, on a weekly basis and I really have been um, actually humbled by the dedication uh, to delivering the best possible services. Obviously when I go around to see the staff at their services um, I'm anticipating possibly lots of questions and queries and <coughs> complaints and moans and improvements which is uh, right for them to do. But actually, I've, I've actually witnessed our staff being exceptionally proud about the services that they're actually delivering. And it has actually been humbling for me to um, have observed that and listen to staff. Yes, there are um, areas for improvement which you would expect that, but um, people are really proud about what they're doing and the work that, that, that they're carrying out on behalf of services and patients. So I was uh, pleased about that. I was also um, Pleased to join colleagues at our Recovery College Forum, and that's where I was, I was able to gain a greater understanding of the courses on offer and opportunities available for both staff and, uh, and service users as well. Um, and so I was humbled by, uh, by my attendance and also being able to share um, some of my experiences with that particular uh, with, with, with the group there. So pleased about that. Um, what was great as well is a highlight there from um, our MPs have been connecting with most of our MPs from the different constituencies across um, our patch, across Birmingham and Solihull, and, and including Solihull MPs as well as, as referenced in my report. Um, but one of the, the highlights is uh, Steve uh, McCabe, MP, following his visit to, um, to the Barbary, and he particularly wanted to visit that service because he wanted to find out more about veterans and how we uh, support them, um, but actually we've got an opportunity to see all of the 
different um, services there in neurodiversity services, and he was so impressed. So much so that, you know, that when MPs write their letters, they're very formal, um, formal head of papers, uh, and they, they get their secretary to do, which is fine. But he actually sent a handwritten personal two letters, uh, a vote of thanks, appreciation, how he was, you know, uh, overwhelmed, and how he was impressed. And also, uh, this is a Labour MP, if, if they, uh, they get in the next the next election. He's, he's there to really support the work that we're doing, and so that's that's really great. And I continue to visit and meet with other MPs, as is referenced um, in my report as well, and I think it's important to engage uh, with the politicians so that we can actually get their support on board, particularly in some of the areas where we're significantly challenged, particularly around our capital bills. And other areas as well so it's really um, great to be able to, to meet and connect with them. Um, the only other point that I wanted to bring to your attention which is around sustainability and this is um, about the Council of Governors meeting which took place in November 2023 and I welcomed uh, new members of the council uh, and we were also assured about the current elections and the vacant posts uh, they were asked to, to ballot. But what I did want to bring to your attention is that there were a number of long-standing governors who came to the end of their term and we wanted to thank them and I want to thank them again here at this uh, board meeting. So that's Dr Imran Waheed and he joined the council at the end of uh, 2022 following the election process. And he was uh, uh, a medical governor and during his time on the council Imran has been a great presence and a voice for medical staff however competing clinical demands has impacted his ability to be able to gain as much momentum as he'd hoped and so Imran has recently been appointed as deputy medical director and that's something to celebrate and so has taken the decision to stand down from his governor role and I'm sure we can all um, join in wishing Imran all the very best as he embarks on his leadership role. And I'd like to thank Imran for his tenure as a governor. Uh, we also have Jim Chapman as well. Jim has started to come to the end of his third term as a governor over the years. Uh, as a governor, and over the years, Jim has been a really valued member of the council, uh, who's always offered support in developing and strengthening our partnerships with the university. Uh, over the years, Jim has supported the trust in ensuring students get the best possible experiences when working with the trust and has always explored new innovative avenues for improvements. And over the recent months, Jim has been a great support and a buddy to a number of our governors and has always taken the time to check in and ensure his governor colleagues are okay. And so I'm pleased to announce that um, he's not here, but we now have Rob Mapp uh, will join the council uh, as the stakeholder governor as Jim's replacement um, and key one-to-one -one meetings have actually been arranged or have actually taken place. And then finally, Vic Vic Fuster, uh, Vic has started in this substantive role, so which is absolutely fantastic within the trust here. So we're keeping it, and therefore she's had to formally resign from her uh, government role. <coughs> and I personally want to acknowledge and to thank Vic for her dedication to the governing body over the years, and for always representing the cons uh, constitution in the best possible manner. Uh, Vic's input and challenge have driven change and developed services in line with best practice for our service users. And again, I'm sure you will join me in wishing Vic all the best in the new role. She's so excited about it, I've spoken to her already. She started, she's doing an absolutely fantastic job. She was just conflicted um, and she knew that she would have to stand down as governor. But I think she's going to make a fantastic contribution in the role that she's taken within the trust. And so a personal thank you from me and I'm sure the rest of the board as well. Um, I don't have any other key points to bring to your attention. My report is there. Happy to accept any questions if there are any.
it isn't a question, well, it's a question of a bit of point of clarity. So under clinical services, the first point you've made is quite rightly that the public sector members and governors are making more visits to services. Yes. But you also make reference to um, DBS checks and, the, um, and I just wanted clarity on um, um, the fact that my understanding is that non-exec exec directors all have DBS checks. So, they do. So, so actually this is all non-execs and most governors. That's this correct. Is, is the, Thank you for that. Um, just to clarify, the, yeah. the, the reference to most governors is because we are out of balance at the moment, and so therefore it's just it's new governors coming in that we're aware of, but not, haven't haven't formally announced yet. So, but everybody else has. That's the most. Got there. But everybody yeah. else. Everyone has been. Yes. Uh, just to be clear. So yeah. Yes. Thank you. And and that includes our uh, youth non-execs. Um, actually, sorry, I didn't actually formally welcome Sue. Uh, this is her first board meeting. Sue Bedford is our new non-executive director, and this is her first time here. Uh, and so, Sue, can I formally welcome you to the board? Sorry, apologies. I should have done that at the beginning. I was just mean I'm not old hat. So, thank you, thank you, uh, Sue. It's good to have you uh, on board. So, it, and thank you for that point of clarity, uh, Sheen, there about the DPS. I am actually going to hand over to you, Sheen, now you. to the Chief Executive Report. So, it's Chief Exec and um, Director of the yes. Report, so uh, the double act of at least myself and Vanessa. Um, so, I'm, I will start, but just to say that I will take the reports with them, just a few things I wanted to highlight and give some further update on giving and um, women's meeting. Um, firstly, other people I just wanted to. Once again, thank all of our colleagues who have been as supportive as they have been to enable those people who wanted to take the industrial action to do so and those that chose not to, to do so too. Um, and I think we've managed that well. It hasn't been that impact as we know, so there are uh, hundreds of appointments that have needed to be organised and rearranged. And we're still unclear, I think, in the long term about what some of the impact of that might be. Um, you will be aware of the announcement yesterday, the very unfortunate announcement yesterday, that uh, we are going to be in a situation where, uh, particularly for junior doctors, they are, remain unsatisfied um, with the offers that are on the table and therefore more substantial, and in fact, the most substantial industrial action we've ever seen in the nations will be taken at what will be the busiest time of the year. We know that. During the Christmas period, lots of people take leave, and that it becomes very busy in the very early part of, um, of the new year, and that's when we are going to, to see many of our colleagues exercising their, their right um, to take industrial action. So we will be putting in place, as we have been, that very um, well-oiled machine, unfortunately, um, of being able to manage that. But again, um, we just wanted to be really clear in public, but we sort of the board that. This isn't without impact, um, and we will need to continue to monitor that as we go forward. And, and we are working, as you would expect, with our, our close partners, particularly NHS providers and the Federation, um, to continue to push the message that this needs to be resolved. Um, it must come from That is not just in the immediacy around council appointments, the potential impact further down the road if those haven't happened, it's impacting on our ability to support people to think about careers in health um, as well. So I uh, just wanted to make those points. From a sustainability point of view, um, we're in a situation, I think at the time of the reporting, we were working towards um, developing a balanced plan based on the fact that industrial action thus far at cost between 1.1 and 1.3 billion pounds. The negotiations between both government and the Department of Health and the NHS have resulted in um, an agreement that the majority of those funds will need to come from existing NHS and Department of Health budgets. Um, and that also means, so whilst <coughs> it has been provided centrally, it also means that the requirement to have a balanced plan for all systems not necessarily all organisations, but all systems in the NHS um, has um, have been, needs to, needed to be um, committed to. So a lot of work has gone on um, across 
um, the system, but across our organisation to determine what would that look like from our perspective, ensuring that we are protecting as far as we possibly can um, uh, all of our services. I'm pleased to say that we're in a position where, um, where we have managed to be able to put forward to NHS England a balanced budget for the system. Um, it's not without, as I said, some challenges, um, but it is designed to protect um, our services. Um, and, and I think we need to thank everybody for working so collectively and so well to, to get to that position. Um, I've obviously mentioned the, um, the fact that we had our session as a board around um, how we use digital, in particular, how can we um, consider better use of digital. And we'll be carrying that question into the organisation. Uh, we've got a session planned with us in the leadership team where that very question is being posed uh, for them as well as other forum. Uh, and we're linking this to our improvement journey as well. So how do we link that to the general uh, improvement work uh, that needs to happen? Um, on the quality side, um, you will see the reports and references to uh, where we uh, where we stand uh, at a high level uh, with some of our um, CQC action um, uh, action plans. Um, at the time of writing, we were expecting the outcome of the um, focused inspection that was undertaken following some risk concerns by our colleagues in CQC uh, around the um, CMHTs. Um, that report has now um, become public, um, and the board will be aware. Um, that it moves the rating for our CMHTs from good to requires improvement. We um, met the deadline of yesterday to um, send off our um, action plan, so there were five must-dos and two should-dos as part of that, and we responded to those in the plan um, that we submitted yesterday. Um, and the board will be very much aware that we report every month, um, particularly through our committees, but also through this report, on the situation in our divisions, and we'll be very much aware of the, um, the fact that you know we've had um, concerns about the level of workforce that is now much improved. Uh, we've had concerns about the levels of caseload um, and the, um, the the wanting to fast track how we've got community transformation in place. And we're very much aware of how significant the community transformation has been in terms of seeing I think about 1,400 people now period that, um, that it's been in place. So still much to do, um, still very much the report enabling us to understand what we need to do more of quicker and faster, uh, but really also supporting a lot of what we were already uh, planning to do and are doing uh, in that domain. Um, Sarah, our colleague from the CQC, is here today and she confirmed to us yesterday that the report following the re-inspection around the Section 31 and the 29A, which was um, issued some time ago, uh, is due now next week. Uh, so we expect to receive that. Um, um, in, 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 uh, so thank you for the communication, Sarah, and we're expecting to receive that. Um, i put a little section in this time around um, uh, being a leader in mental health, because I think this is something that's very much prominent of prominence in our strategy. We talk a lot about um, um, when we see ourselves as being a lead. And in fact, some of the um, public um, who are listening now won't have been um, able to hear this morning, but we have a really powerful and inspiring um, uh, story from um, somebody who was a patient who now works very significantly for us as an expert by experience. And that is an area where we've always seen ourselves actually as a leader in mental health, and I think it's important to acknowledge that that work is, um, um, is, 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 is really supporting us as an organisation um, and defines us as a leader in our, in our work. Um, but I've also put a few other things in the, in the report. Uh, congratulations to the BIDA for, you know, um, we are the organisation in mental health that has the psychiatrist to feel it. Opportunity, I think, for us to, to make clear that's something to celebrate. I think it's something that, that, that we, we hope people who are interested in coming to the organisation understand that they'll be joining an organisation where that is, you know, that, that, that the, um, the input of our colleagues.
colleagues will be very much recognised, not just by us, but by nationally by others. Um, you'll also see a number of um, pieces in there around services that we've been providing for some time, where we've held conferences or um, uh, where we've been seen that we come to organisations to find out more about some of those things that are happening. So I won't go through all of those. Um, I also set out for the board some of the work that we've been, we did during October around Black History Month in terms of celebrating our colleagues wearing black, um, black hair. Really well, it was a real opportunity I think, for, to, to celebrate and for acknowledgement from colleagues of each other. Um, um, and also, um, you'll see a small piece in there around um, uh, an area where um, Freedom to speak up has, has, made, has made a difference because also during October it's freedom to speak up uh, that month as well. Um, I've, I've put a report in there so while since we last met, um, the CQC State of Care um, uh, 2022-23 report. Um, we've also done some work internally on the specifics that I mentioned within it around mental health, but there's a link into that. Um, what the, the report that's also been published since we mark, last met is the, um, the Breaking the Silence Addressing the Sexual Harassment in Healthcare mm -hmm. report um, that was published, and we'll have an opportunity later on as a board to both receive that report but to have a first conversation about what this might mean for us um, as an organisation as well. Um, also, from a quality point of view, I wanted to reflect on the fact that um, we have received another um, preventing future deaths. Um, from our local coroner, particularly in relation to the availability of, um, of beds in the system. Um, there was an article yesterday in the Health Service Journal, and that's why I thought it was important to address it in the public today. Um, and of course, we are thoughts at this moment in time on the families um, of those that have been impacted by this individual who lost their life, um, which is what the coroner's inquest was all about. Um, the coroner has issued that on the basis that they recognise that it's both a local and a national issue, and we recognise that as, a, as an ongoing issue for us. Um, the coroner talked about the recognition that, that some work had been done, but, 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 that, but that he saw it as an insufficient to close the gap, and we recognise that, that it hasn't. So we absolutely recognise that, that our bed base remains. Um, Considered to be um, the requirement for our population. That said, I do want to be able to say in public that a huge amount of work has gone into trying to establish a means of, of closing that gap. We will remember that we put forward a, um, um, a business plan to the new hospitals and um, capital regime. Um, we weren't successful, but indeed, no mental health organisation in the country was successful. Um, all of that funding went to providers. What we have done as a consequence of that is we have escalated the risks and we've escalated it formally um, through formal processes through the ICE integrated care system to the region and the region are supporting us around what an alternative plan might look like and we are looking at ways of being able to manage creating some new capacity through building that would mean that we wouldn't be reliant on capital from anywhere else but the system. Um, and that's been progressed, but of course it will take time. In the meantime, we are commissioning some additional uh, beds from the independent sector, and we are managing to drive down the number of people who are going into active area placements. So as we sit here today, for over three months, as an organisation, we now have a sustained downward trend around people who are going out and receiving their care somewhere other than in Berlin and so So whilst we're not there, and whilst we recognise that, 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 that there are still risks around this, that we are managing to make something related to provide a better situation for the population that we're here to serve. Um, I'm going to hand over now to um, Vanessa, and to talk about our clinical services, and I hope the board will have recognised that uh, in this particular report we're, we're moving much more to not just reporting on what some of our challenges are, but, but actually what some of the things to, for us to acknowledge as 
has been celebratory in terms of achieving um, achieving inroads into some of our challenges, but then more indeed um, just making a better um, opportunity for our citizens and our community. Thank you, Roshi. Thank you. Um, as Roshi says, our unit did a report as readiness and resilience in collapsing things. And yeah, I feel that, you know, the division is wanting to celebrate some of their successes. Sometimes it feels a bit sort of do and gloom to the challenges, so that was absolutely, you know, um, what was called for in the report. Also, um, the division wanted to have the service user voice heard as well. So there's some quotes in here, which again, are really, really endearing to hear around, you know, some of the work that we're doing, so that was really good. Um, Throughout the last couple of months, we continue to focus on the safety and recovery of our service users, as well as the well-being of our staff. That's absolutely, you know, driven through all of our through all of our divisions. We continue to drive our performance, looking at our outcomes. And I talk about green shoots. We do have green shoots. You know, Roshi was just mentioned one there, just around our the, the reduction in, in placing people out of area and bringing people back. So that's really, really great to, to hear and to to showcase. Um, also, a highlight um, throughout the report the collaborative work we're doing within the system and beyond, again, really sort of showcasing that and how we're part of our system and how we are using mental health and actually you know, you know, driving that through also. So, just pull out a few key areas well, I can see. My glasses on. Um, I think from uh, community services, again, acknowledgement around um, their inspection report um, from August uh, of this year. So, you know, the, the, the teams really, really worked particularly around the, the immediate concerns that were raised and wanted to showcase in the report today, you know, the actual the outcomes of that work, you know, showing percentage increases around the care programme approach plans and um, risk assessments, really, really focused work around that, um, which we're, we're very proud of. Um, also showing that, you know, quality audits that are under opinions that work, so it's great to have that KPI there achieving that, what does the quality of those look like? So that's been drawn through in the audits as well. Um, Acknowledgements also just around in the performance meetings and in the service deep dives, just around you know, the challenges they do have with their caseloads, you know, and the piece of work actually looking at you know, the past five years, how those caseloads have increased significantly year on year, you know, with a real challenge around stepping down and discharging people. Until we've had the community transformation, now the neighbourhood teams absolutely working really, really well together around that. Real drive around our community transformation. You know, we are finding more people who are presenting a lot more calling, a lot more complex, you know, due to, to some of the um, challenges throughout the COVID period. And um, wanted also to bring up a, in our CCR, our integrated community and recovery services, support around the neighbourhood teams that I mentioned just uh, now a while ago. Also, that we took part in what was classed as a perfect week in our system. Um, so we had our mental health clinicians as part of a, a, a virtual team looking at people presenting within an ambulances, presenting in A&E, and actually how we could work quicker, more effectively together to actually divert people to support them a lot quicker, along with our primary care colleagues. Some great outcomes we were hearing from that piece of work. Um, and we're having a workshop next week to see how we can how we can continue to work in that way. And um, specifically in the east of the city, where we've got some of our real challenges. So again, really really exciting times. Um, and again, just to showcase, you know, when we work together, when we're focusing on the needs of citizens, our residents actually get to have great outcomes together as a, as a system. If we move on to our secure care offender health, wanted to highlight. Um, about the staffing improving in, in HMP Birmingham mm -hmm. in our prison. It's always been a real hot spot that I've highlighted here before, but actually now we do have new um, new staff starting and are supporting our colleagues as part of that collaborative um, model um, with their sort of with their staffing um, <coughs> challenges also. And um, we had a, an NHS quality review that took place um, a few months back and um, our verbal feedback is, you know, vast improvements in what they're actually seeing and what we were showcasing around, I mentioned here, staff, the culture, attention, and the, the actual quality and delivery of care. So that was a really good thing to celebrate. Also mentioned here just around a uh, business case that we've submitted to our commissioners around an enhanced reconnect uh, business case um, around a psychology, so psycho psychologically led service around uh, counter-terrorism. Terrorism, people who are discharged from prison. 
So again, a really, really new model to compare the way of working and the approach actually to support this business case. So again, very, very proud of that and we expect to see the outcome in a couple of months' time. <clears throat> we move on to acute and urgent care. What I did highlight in here, which was um, our service user of um, story was the celebrated the first patient council. I'll put it in here as well, and I know we've heard it as a committee, so I think everywhere we're all celebrating that really, really, uh, you know, really, really good piece of work and how we want that to continue. And I a lovely statement here by one of the service users and all that feedback was really positive on the service users give real time feedback was very refreshing. And again, I think very, very enlightening. You know, I think Ian really explained that really well about what happened in the division. So I've got no doubt that will go, you know, continue from strength to strength. Um, go back just to our productivity plan, which is part of our um, plan to drive down our improved task areas. Again, a huge piece of work. We meet weekly and absolutely drive you through what that plan is actually saying we need to be doing and holding ourselves to account on a weekly basis around that. Reporting into our system again from the oversight and assurance that we are driving that plan through. This is where I talk about green shoots, chair. So our green shoots just around we're working in our work as a locality model, locality model specifically in the central and west areas, and actually looking at taking a real drive around that quality improvement approach, learning from what we're doing, making those changes. We're actually seeing some real, real um, early reporting around. The decrease in delay transfers of care because we're looking at individually working with our partners, specifically our local authority partners around that work with our GPs. More timely admissions for complex service users in the community who are being um, supported by our home treatment teams and actually have driven down our active areas. So, again, looking at the locality, working with our teams, actually making a huge, huge difference around our active areas. Um, big piece of work again, focusing on delay transfers of care. Um, we've got a real spotlight on, on, on that work at this moment in time, um, and again, you know, real scrutiny. Um, really, be clear about some of those challenges and why those detox, as we're calling them, delay transfers of care, are occurring, and some focus work again with our local authority colleagues around that. So, if I move us on to our specialities, frailty and dementia. I think um, probably would have been about four or five pages. I've had to really put that down again. Lots of celebrations in there that say we want to put in report uh, this month. Um, <clears throat> want to note around the NHS and uh, National Perinatal Webinar, which is a real successful piece of work showcasing the work that we've done. We have other systems now asking for our advice and wanting to sort of make any work as we've been doing in that area. Still remain challenged in the patient wards from an adult perspective, but we've got four international. Um, recruited nurses joining the division, which is absolutely great, and they'll be um, they'll be on all of our inpatient wards. Um, again, noting the CMHTs and the collaborative work around in all green, particularly around a um, different way of introducing cognitivity RCA, which is a different assessment tool. So that's that's been working well, um, specifically around uh, dementia services. And again, I think probably finally, um, talking therapies. 13 new qualified staff in our service. Again, we raise here on a regular basis some of our staffing challenges in our talking therapies and building and healthy minds. Again, another green shoot. People maybe a bit more of a bit of grass in that area as opposed to a shoot. We've got a bit of a lawn growing there. So that's really good news just to say that, you know, we're actually then now looking at we have the staffing in place, how we actually put our trajectories in that area. And then finally, just a statement from our art therapist in our group. Um, just around the assistant gave it to a daughter and um, to explore any special feelings around death through art therapy. You know, that's that work um, with our art therapists in town was absolutely just really overwhelming and really, really helped her and to, to help with her grieving. I think I'll stop there. I could talk for longer, but. Thank you, Vanessa. So, thank you, Rasheen and Vanessa. Can I open any questions for either Rasheen or Vanessa after you have listened to the report? Um, I think you probably answered it in the report, Vanessa, but it, it, it's particularly the, the benefits from a, a sort of quality and safety perspective of the work that you've been doing in the localities, and that because that's been a theme through so many of our sort of incidents and risks around that shared ownership of the care pathway of the patient coming up through to MHT home treatment, needing admission, it's moving out again into yeah. the community. It, it, it's really positive to hear that the impact that's having, not just from a maybe reduction in out of area need, but that 
I suppose it's the safety of that part that pathway and that appropriateness of what patients are getting at the different steps of their pathway. Are you, are you rolling it out across the whole of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, part of, as part of our point before you plan that we have for our day to better if that's one of our work streets. And there's quite a detailed plan into their around sort of delivery with milestones. So we're rolling it out in the south, in fact, I think we rolled it out to Monday in the south, I stated to you on Monday. Um, and we'll do some work in the north around the engagements of our, of our teams in the north of the rollout there. So again, there's learning that's, you know, at least Dr. Saraj Vincent, who's leading that, who's, who's like, um, um, you know, really inspirational about how he's working with them, you know, across the piece along with the senior leadership team. And again, the learning from there, you know, it's, it's, there's a bit of a blueprint, the principles, but that might be slightly different in the south based on the population, based on how the teams work. So, you know, and again, the tweaking, the quality improvements and that drive of actually learning and changing is being really, really, really beneficial. But again, it's how we bring all that together then and showcase what's, what that looks like. Um, and particularly when we're working over in the East, and, you know, working that model there and then bringing that together with what we do as a you know, community collaborator as a system, again, we're finding those benefits actually coming from a physical health perspective of working, you know, even close with our GP colleagues and with our colleagues and building community trust. That is absolutely starting to join the more and more as well there. So can you just ask for that? Mm -hmm. So I know staff did a really good job in that area and there's particular search for us including this leadership. That's not going to be exactly the same as well. No. What do we do to try and make sure the conditions are the same or we're clear about what we need to do to get the same out of impact? Because we have seen things like we've brought to go try and go on yeah. Yeah, I mean we've tried a different approach this time. I mean, I think it's sort of it's, it's very much clinically laid down. So sort of, you know, cell is going over um, the video and I are both, you know, joint SROs for the work. Cell's actually going over with the team and sitting with them and talking with them, you know, driving, showing showing the data and showing the outcomes. So this is not just oh, this is a really good thing to do. These are the benefits and this is how we're showcasing it. So that approach, sitting with your clinicians in the room, working face to face on that, that's that's our different approach. And I think it's actually people are listening now and people are wanting to, you know, to, to work similar in that way as well. So would you like to start? Would you think? Yeah, I would think that it also helps the patient experience because it's the clinicians who know the patients who are having the discussions in that locality and uh, both in run at my deputy. And I have been uh, chairing a few meetings for the wards with the crisis team and with other people who know the patient to discuss what's the plan. So we discuss the people already on the ward and then we discuss that locality patients who are out of area. So we're rolling it out, it's in the diary for all our 60 wards as as start in the next few months. And where, where uh, it's happened, actually the teams have really appreciated yes. that support because if there are delays, then I can take it to Vanessa, Vanessa takes it to the system. So it's sort of like they're supporting them and they're feeling that they can make a difference. But the, the main thing is that it's a few clinicians who really know the patient uh, doing the best thing. Great. Steve? Yeah, it's really invested in people's time. So if you say quality improvement methodology around that, I mean, we as well, Vanessa, and to the point, Linda, around the patient, the patient experience, but also the patient safety. We'll go on later to talk about the piece of plan, but just to remind the board and public that actually we base uh, six priorities, two of them being around that fragmentation in pathways, access transfer and discharge. So the patient safety priorities are based on what we're moving in, into in terms of the new model as well. So it all marries up in that triangulation it's, it's, as a result of all of those elements that being factored in. And of course, if it isn't working, then what the QI methodology, positive methodology allows is for us to stop and move forward again in a different way to make sure that the patient pathway is right. That's great. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, more in relation to your update, Vanessa, on integrated community care and recovery. Uh, in the second paragraph, you make reference to the fact that the clinicians, doctors, and psychological therapists have raised concerns regarding the increasing demand and capacity. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that so we continue to be this part of our community transformation. So, my question is so, what we really see are the, con the constraints and opportunities for faster community transformation? Uh, I mean, that's a good, a good question. I mean, the community transformation is is is, is very very well laid out. Um, you know, we have a uh, PMO, and um, we're very very clear around milestones and plans around that. <clears throat> what we've had, what we've 
what we've worked on and what we've challenged ourselves is, is around fast tracking some of the posts and bringing them in quicker, particularly the posts, like I mentioned above, in the neighbourhood teams. So bringing those posts in quicker and rolling them out in the areas and again doing that learning. What we've also done is, is, is listened to our, to our teams and, you know, with the region and I want to work with teams around a business case um, to support more clinical leaderships in CMHGs as well. So we have, we've We've invested in clinical needs, again, to help the existing walls of sort of oversight and leadership in, 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 the, in the divisions. Also, we've been around investment around, you know, there's lots of, lots of new investment coming in as part of the transformation. How does that link in more with the community mental health teams and how do we do things differently? We don't always need to have maybe a nurse there, but do we have recovery workers? And a good example of, of you know, recovery workers is our is our collaboration with, with Birmingham Mind. We have, we have you know, the, our um, recovery workers in one of our rehab units and we work the same <coughs> with the abuse mental health teams. So I think, you know, under that PMO, under, under the PMO sort of umbrella, under that plan, again, there's lots of sort of work, you know, what we can do quicker and faster. So it's all challenged as part of, as part of that, as part of that group. Um, but listening to our commissions and trying to bring things forward is absolutely what we can do. You know, and again, working really closely with our primary care colleagues has been a has been a bit of a key piece of work as well. <coughs> Just add to that that we've got a series of workshops planned yeah. with our community colleagues because a, a lot of the support we give people early is what's going to help them prevent crisis and admissions. So I think we we, we might look at fundamentally changing a lot of the way we give care, working closely with the neighbourhood teams and primary care. And we've started a monthly meeting in East locality with our GP colleagues and our consulting yeah. colleagues. That's gone really well, and we're hoping to take that to other areas as well. So, I've got one more question to share. I think, Lace, on one of the um, acute allergic care, mm -hmm. I noted that so we're working with West Midlands Ambulance Service and West Midlands Police to support direct access to psychiatric, psychiatric decision. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering. Is a psychiatric decision, does it have the um, extra capacity to cover that potential increased demand? I'm just, I'm just worried that uh, we end up getting into territory that other services should be really um, providing that support. And equally, I think I feel there's a risk there that so um, if we had to be taken on some of those, then are we potentially creating a risk to our, to our staff? Yeah. So we've, we've done some modelling work around this, around this and just give some sort of assurance and we do work really close with the ambulance service and other police. We do find that, that some of our service users will, will, will call an ambulance, the ambulance then will take them directly to A&E and it's not particularly because of a physical health need, but <coughs> because of, of, of you know mental health crisis. So what we're trying to do is work with them and this is very much around um, the, the plan we've got around Cork before you convey is having that conversation with the ambulance. There's no need to take them to A &E because again in A &E, they were seen by our psychiatric um, um, team there very, very quickly. What coming into a PDU, our psychiatric decisions unit, is a much more therapeutic space to do that assessment. So obviously it's, it's all based on need, it's based on risk, it's based you know from, from a clinician's oversight point of view. Um, our PDU has six phases in there with, with a capacity to extend further. Um, so we feel that it, it does have the capacity to actually to meet those needs. Of course, we, we put some additional staff in there as well, particularly around the end call before you can play, um, which is just recently, last week, this week on then 24 7 as well. So, massive piece of work we're doing, um, and you know, we work very, very closely with, with, our, with our wellness colleagues in the London service. So, we think it's okay, we'll monitor it. You know, we're just going to sit back and leave it, we'll actually we'll manage it, monitor it. And again, it's a bit like our, you know, quality improvement. We're, we're finding this, let's try something different, let's keep monitoring and working together. Um, and we do work very closely with, with like I say, with Wormass and our, our colleagues in the ICB around this new initiative. We've got very, very proud about the way we're working here. I mean, it's again, you know, it's sort of outside of the, outside of the norm and a different way of working, so. And, and uh, how, would, how would we be able to track that time difference? Is it the way that people still want to say more to the um, yeah. West Midlands Ambulance or the, or the West Midlands Ambulance? I'd say yeah. the, the benefits is to our service users, and that's kind of why we're doing it. You know, it's going to take the pressure off of our acute colleagues, of people sitting in an A&E department waiting for transfer. 
it would take you know pressure off the police again and, and, and bring the service user or support the service user to the right environment and a better pathway for them as well because we can link in into the, the pathways we have from the PDU. I'd say benefits for everybody really, but it more so our service user. Did you see it on when you're on call, you see it going through because otherwise you go to the wrong place, you know, manage chaotically, problem yeah. for problem for us. Yeah. It just gets them to the right Absolutely. Place. And we have lots of data. I mean, we've, we've, we've showcased the data here before, again, sort of by using this different model and showing the better outcomes. We'll keep a real close eye on it. And that's helpful, um, yeah. actually, for our system partners to, to see that as well. So yeah. see the impact that that this is how this collaborative approach is actually having, because there's a lot of talk at the moment within the system. In terms of what are the mental health trusts doing yeah. when patients actually yeah. turn up to A and E and then have to that automatically <laughs> understanding that some of those patients do have um, physical needs, um, you know, ailments that needs to be. Oh, prepared. absolutely, then that's what I mean. We're talking about the, the discussion rather than about supporting them in terms of mental health. You know, just stuff there to have help because there was that reaction they talked us through and we're working through that. So I'm not sure where we got to in terms of that. But it's just trying to respond to exactly that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah. And then Val's got a question, and I've just got the final two before we move on. Yeah, just slightly more macro level. It's great to hear um, the, the, the work that's going on. And I think it will create a real positive culture around continuous improvement, um, which, which is fantastic. We, we can hopefully showcase. And it's great that the team's <coughs> focusing on both the sort of quality of tier of safety and uh, efficiency type uh, opportunities that, that, that change will deliver. Um, I just wanted to make sure that from a, from a, a, a macro a macro level, whilst we're looking at the, the opportunities and benefits, uh, at a, at a, you know, in terms of focusing on a, on a problem, um, the volume of change that an, an organisation would have to absorb can be also just disruptive. And I'm just wondering whether we've got an eye on that part of, of, of the of the equation as well, just to make sure that you know we, we don't overload our teams um, with, with change initiatives at the same time we've got to keep the lights on, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. but, you know, and, and it's very important, it's hugely important. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time it's hugely important that we do drive that, 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 that change because so it's only from a sort of financial lens. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's it's vitally important that we, we start to drive um, the current on going recurrent savings. Yes, okay. Uh, no, I think one of the reasons that we're seeing this much change coming at uh, this stage is, is not that it's been driven by us organisationally, but we're beginning to meet the benefits of, of the work that we've done around change is everybody's responsibility. The improvements can be made by anybody in the organisation. And if you take that example of what's happening, that, that, was, that came from Commission taking the view that actually I I I you know I have the responsibility I can take I can step into this space and so actually the distribution of people taking responsibility is greater now than it has been previously so you're right that we need to continue to make sure we're not we're not doing too much and overloading people but also doing so much that we can't properly assess that it's, that it's doing the right things. Um, and we've got a framework through of that through our quality improvement um, framework that's been reviewed and through NAT's leadership, NAT Rose's right. leadership, um, in terms of where all this sits. But I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing so much of it right now, mm -hmm. is that we're beginning to leave that benefit. That's great. I just wanted to be sure that, you know, having experiences, you know, can, there's a danger of getting into sort of change for you and that having a an adverse effect uh, to, to staff and patients. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I just want to add to uh, today. So I really proud in terms of initiating overload. I mean, uh, uh, there is a risk <coughs> of the conversations that we've had. Uh, Vanessa referred to it perfectly. It's very much how to ensure that we're not saying to staff, you need to continue to do what you've always done and this. Mm. It's, it's actually thinking about this is the way of working uh, and being able to monitor and track the impact. Otherwise, it just be added on top of what people see as, as their day job. 
are actually what Vanessa is describing is the data, and that's the way we should be working rather than actually adding on. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Just finally, just to, to, to close up the report, uh, I suppose it's a, a, a statement from the machine and uh, sort of Vanessa. Um, what's referenced in the report is the um, around the delays. Uh, transfer of care, mm -hmm. and uh, and also sort of correlating that with the demand mm -hmm. in the community, particularly around ICMHTs and the increase of uh, referrals. And I just wondered in relation to the correlation, because obviously if we don't get that bit, there's going to be a blockage, and those people mm -hmm. uh, who are represented for in the community that are quoting to access services are likely to be um, requiring of that because of the deterioration of their of their health. Are we are we actually seeing seeing that? And what impact is that actually potentially having on our colleagues? Yeah, I mean we have services in the community that pick people up at crisis, our home treatment teams. So you know that's that's uh, their teams in all of the localities that work close with the community and the health teams and they gain people the missions. So if people are known to us in the community crisis, they will be supported under duty from a CMHG perspective, but they may be transferred into the home treatment team. <coughs> so you know, there's not a, you don't go from a CMHG straight into, into, into a baby if you need yeah. one. So home treatment team, you know, they are very highly skilled, they're high threshold around risk. Then, um, you know, we'll have visits up to three times a day for people who are really quite poorly. You know, not everybody in a home treatment team would come into a bed, but there are people in a home treatment team which we describe as complex. They may need to come into a bed, which is why the locality working when you've got, you know, Dr. Vincent, Dr. Charles Vincent, who's working in a home treatment team and working in a new patient ward, who's saying, okay, I've got a couple of people here who need to come into a bed tomorrow, I've got a couple of people here who need to be discharged. How do we work together and do it, and, and, you know, to make sure that that's People are coming into hospital when they really, really do need to, and people are discharged and go out and are supported. But again, we can't do this on our own. You know, we have to do this with, with the community mental health teams. And um, you know, we're working obviously from an older adult perspective, the older adults in HGs as well. So again, it, it's that working through. We are challenged. You know, we have brought some extra bed capacity um, within Birmingham, in particular, just to help us work all of this through. Um, but I feel we've got a lot of our, our investment and a lot of our focus at the moment on the urgent care end. Mm -hmm. We need to start working, which is what we're doing now, and sort of drive some of that investment into the community, into the early intervention. And again, we don't do that on our own. So then working in locality, working with our local authority colleagues, working with communities, that prevention piece, which we don't have to do, you know, others can do, which is part of our mental health provider collaborative as well. How can we do that differently in locality? So it's, it's a major transformation. We, I think it feels like we're transforming every division, but then it's how it all comes together as part of this wider model, which, you know, as we're the lead provider from the London Health it's, it's age inclusive. So it's, it feels complex, but it's, you can see the jigsaw slowly sort of being pulled together in a chair. Um, but, it, you know, it does have it risk, as its risks and it does have its challenges, but we've got some amazing clinicians. Managers out there who really want to make a difference. So, I just wanted to add, and I think it's really important, particularly and again, because we're meeting in public, I think it's important to say that you know we've, we've, we've expressed quite a lot of concern here, haven't we, about um, Birmingham City Council also yeah. being in a situation um, effectively being bankrupt, and concerns that that might mean that, that actually the work that we might want to do around direct transfers of care yeah. might be hindered on that. And I just wanted to, to, to kind of um, share that with our, our experience is exactly the opposite. Is that we are receiving, continuing to receive really great support um, from our colleagues at the City Council, and they have in fact confirmed to us that around the delayed transfer of care work, that one of the issues we know is the availability of social workers yeah. to support people's discharge. It's not about our community teams necessarily, it's about that, and they have agreed to make some investment into some of those social services, and, and that's against that backdrop of um, mm -hmm. you know, relatively concern about the, you know, the ability, if you like, to be able to do this. They are um, really demonstrating their commitment to core services, so, um, and that will help with the point that you 
Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you both. And just finally, it's just a comment really, the machine, and probably too early to give any um, affirmative um, actions that are going to take, take place. But we started off the report by mentioning the I suppose, continued industrial actions with the junior doctors, and obviously in January, the six days, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of days, uh, a few days before Christmas as well. Um, in the past, uh, I suppose the NHS as a whole, you know, in, in relation to our trust, we've, we've quoted and we've adapted very well. We've, we've you know, obviously supported in the sense that uh, our colleagues who want to make that decision. What impact is the six days likely to have potentially? Well, I think, I think this is going to be the most worrying um, stint of industrial action because of where it falls. Yes, that's correct. Uh, when it comes and the fact that the luxury is continuing to you know, how do you sustain um, a, um, a situation where you continue to ask others to do more and support those that, that um, want to take their industrial action with the right to do so? Um, and so I think that the sustainability of that model of working is going to be is, is questionable. But it's, I think the impact is going to be great because of the timing. Um, as well as the length. So this is going to be six consecutive days that you not had that before. So actually when you take into account the weekends within that, we're actually talking about a much wider period of time. So I think it's difficult to predict. I think there's, you know, the level of concern is much greater. Um, I think, you know, everyone had hoped, everyone had really put their, you know, their hope in the fact that this wouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. And so like, we're putting as much energy into supporting in our partnerships, the message about this must, must be resolved, this needs to be resolved, as we are into what else does it mean we need to do um, in terms of the support. I mean, we've got a fairly well on machine, unfortunately, as I said, around how we manage these things. Um, and so history is a, an indicator of what, how we might cope. And I think, you know, the, it's just the indications are there that we will cope well as well as we possibly can. Um, but I think there is more concern this time around. Okay. I just add, add to that that usually what we have to do is cancel the routine things, but some of our teams have gone out of their way and seen people earlier than the strike rather than just cancel it for the time. So we've already started looking into what we need to do and you know, emails to be going out. We've managed to cover all the shifts so far. It is going to be more challenging, but it's, it's been really good support from people, and some people have consciously not taken strike because they've been concerned about patient care, mm -hmm. not because they don't want to, but because they're concerned about safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for both uh, Rasheen and Vanessa for your reports. Um, moving on with the agenda, and it's over um, to myself, and it's just to give the board an update around staff and service user stories. And this actually came about because, um, as most NHS boards have either patient or staff story, um, we didn't want it to appear as if it's kind of some form of tick box. We wanted to have an assessment at the end of the year of what we have actually done about some of the stories that we've heard some of the areas of improvements that needs to be made in our services and also how we've actually celebrated um, some, some, some stories, some areas that people have drawn to our attention through, uh, through their own experiences. So this report here is just actually to give you an oversight over the past 12 months and we will continue to do this on a yearly basis so that we can track exactly what we are doing and the improvements that we have made from the stories that have been shared with us here at the boards. I'm not proposing actually to go through it, but just to bring a couple of um, highlights as noted here for those of you who may not have seen the report or those of you who are online and who may be watching. Um, we've heard from a range of divisions um, throughout the year from staff and have, uh, it's been noted here in the report, challenges across secure sites, including the development of high profit and race side and we've heard about that. Um, and understand it. ICT challenges remain a key concern in relation to Rio um, access. ESR management has been a challenge. We've heard about that. I've heard about that personally when I've been um, around on my visits. 
Um, and, um, and, and with regards to that challenge, the developments are actually being made on the system, um, that being um, complex and, and, as we know, a bit clunky and not that user friendly. Um, and also, just picking out another one improvement in our asset areas were noted with the development of the community and transformation as well. That's um, gone on. I'm not proposing to go through all of the report. Just also wanted to um, mention this year we've only heard from one service user. One this year, two cancellations. And two cancellations, that's right. Um, uh, and who've been able to share their experience, particularly with uh, eating disorders uh, services. Um, challenges within the integration of eating disorder services and the restrictions for service users to be able to take control of their routines. These, these were raised as well. And following the challenges raised, the board been to visit the service uh, on numerous occasions to be able to review what can be done to support the concerns that were actually raised with us at the board. And there has since been a service user focus group developed to allow for trust and key concerns with, um, with service uh, users leading the change. And also, the board has now also secured the funding for a food management manager. And that was actually raised by Ian as well. I mean, the concerns that he was raising, particularly uh, in the north of the city, um, some of the service users talking about um, some complaints about food. And I've actually um, witnessed that and had a chat um, with Rope Machine. And also, um, we we own the sister, Hayley. As well. So, as a board, we do look forward to continuing <coughs> to receive these stories to allow us to actually focus on key areas that do require our support. So, I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention and also to the wider public as well. And then, on to me. Yeah. So, so, I just wanted to, to add, I think, as part of that wider um, service user story, there were also issues about how we respond to people who are autistic yeah. um, and we offered at that time to uh, for that individual to be more involved in the work that we were doing and that's also happened and we are doing a significant piece of work around how we offer more training so I think that was one of the key issues um, that came out of the market. so I just wanted to add that. Yeah, thank you. So I've got question on the future. How do we select who actually presents those movies? Is there a so our colleagues in um, um, in, in experts by experts, that's why Catherine, Catherine Allen um, coordinates the, the, the story. She talks to the number of search users through, the, well, through mainly through the kind of um, framework that we heard about today, which is we've got experts by experience working in different settings. They come together. Catherine works with them. People people's stories come to the fore whether they're whether they're positive, negative, or indeed a mixture of those things. <laughs> Um, and Catherine works with individual service users then to determine whether they're prepared to, to come. We've had some by um, that we did on remotely because people haven't been in a position to or haven't wanted to. Um, so, but that's the, the, the process. That's a good point. And, and we are actually reviewing that myself and Machine had a, a, a chat about it only this week to talk about how we can why we uh, get into the, the uh, voices of, of other service users within. Within our trust, and also just to, to, to mention as well, um, this is a, a report um, over the past year. We're also now we've implemented having staff and uh, search user voices at our committee meetings. So it's not just about our board and public meetings, but we're also wanting to hear and, and see how we can move and make changes at our committee levels as well. So that's that's taking place as well, which is really positive to hear. I'm going to move on to um, our board um, site visits. And again, I'm pleased to offer the board of directors a summary of the board service visits throughout 2023. One thing that I wanted to start off with is for me, and it's a, a particular passion of mine, is about board visibil visibility, about leadership visibility. It's about us actually getting out there <coughs> and being visible so that our colleagues uh, don't just see us almost kind of in an ivory tower, but we're actually going out to our services, being visible, speaking to, to um, our colleagues, but also speaking to, to the recipients of our services, basically, and finding out 
from them how they feel about the surveys and so that we can triangulate um, the information, the reports that we can receive and all to the betterment of our, not just the service users but also to our staff as well and look at our wellbeing offer. So here are some key highlights that have actually been noted from our board visits throughout the year and you will notice back at the bottom there, Rasheen actually um, already does this but the visit plan for 2024 has been um, developed alongside the proposal for board members to go back to the floor where we'll be scheduled to work alongside staff on shifts. It's not a mandate, you're not forced to do it. But we would encourage you to do that because we will actually get a flavour of what it's like on the ground. Obviously, there'll be some parameters in relation to that. But I know that Machine does a couple of times has done shadowing um, in relation to different services. I don't think I'm alone, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I think the number of people in the room. <coughs> I mean, and, you know, sometimes it's not appropriate to stay for the whole yeah. of the shift, but you know, a few hours is something that you'll get, you'll get, you'll, it will give you a window um, into um, the experiences of our service users. And, uh, and, and I have to say, almost without fail, the, 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 attention, of, the attention that staff pay to individuals is, you know, really comes across. Yeah, so I would welcome that to take place in 2024. This is, I'm sorry, that didn't make reference to our other exec colleagues um, that I know that you do, Shelby, as well. I hope you do. Um, but um, I think it's really important. There's some services that I've been to that they don't know what the non executive director is, um, and they haven't seen them, and so forth. And so, uh, since I've been in this role, I think every, every, most weeks I'm out as a service somewhere. And I'm really, really humbled by what I hear and also by, by what I see, which is fantastic work. And also, not to forget as well, I just wanted to make this point that our services stretch as far as solid as well. And we've got our solid services, our colleagues over there that sometimes can feel as if they're the poor relation because everything tends to happen around Birmingham, the largest city. But actually, when you go out to the Solid Bond, you can see the work that they're doing. They do some fantastic, fantastic work. Um, and so I'm looking forward to not just our board colleagues, but also our governors as well. And so that invitation has been, um, is, is reached out to them as well, that they can um, support us and have a kind of coordinated approach to going across and seeing uh, uh, our services. So. That's the, the, the purpose and the focus of my report around our board, board visits. Okay, so if we can move on to <coughs> time. And so moving over to the people, committees, assurance, reports, it's time to. Yes, so, um, obviously, we have our triple A report, we have alert, assure, and advise, and take as the reports are read. Um, in terms of alert for the latest committee meeting that we had on the 22nd of November, um, we were alerted to the fact that there was a particular gap in the workforce uh, in regards to registered mental health nurses, but we were also very assured, we were assured uh, that, the work, that the teams are doing and trying to address that gap mm -hmm. as well. And we will be getting a further report at the um, January meeting. Um, we saw some improvements with the bank and agency spend, which was really good. And we saw that improvement in the previous month as well, because there's two reports um, within the packs, and I'll kind of take both of those things together. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of assurance, uh, again, there's been a steady increase in the appraisal performance, which has been reported to committee. Um, members might recall that in previous months that was something that we had uh, mm -hmm. alerted the board to as being potential problems. It's been great to see that that has kind of improved and uh, we've received the assurance that we wanted on that. Um, and we commended the work that's been ongoing to appoint international nurses to the organisation and we're made aware that there's been some additional funding that's also been available to recruit further 20 nurses. <laughs> there was lots of positive feedback from staff networks that we received um, and it was agreed that we were to have some regular attendance from representatives from those networks at the committee as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been working with Cat and to make sure that that happens. Um, 
on, on their plans for continued communication and feedback to staff on the actions that have been um, that are rising from the staff survey. Um, at that time, there was a 46.77% response rate, but I know that there was still it was still on Yes, it does. Yes. So yeah, I think we met the target that we set ourselves. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's the case, but I think we were on track at the time yeah. to meet that target. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, advising you guys, there's high levels of stress and anxiety, unfortunately, across the organisation, which is reflective of all trusts. So I wouldn't want anybody to think that that's exclusive to our trust, but it has prompted a deep dive into sickness data. Uh, with a focus on qualified and unqualified nursing. Um, so we're going to try and explore the reasons behind that. Still be deep dive that, that will come to the committee. Um, and then we also heard from the chapter representative about the partnership that's been had uh, been held with help having help others, which is another charity and how we can potentially work together um, as an organization. So Thank you, thank you, Monica. Sorry, um, Sue, I don't know if you're first time putting onto the hotspot. I just wanted to double check. Are there any questions uh, following the short report? Um, just wanted just to, to highlight the, the last point that you mentioned, Monica, which is the, um, the increase in terms of sickness levels. I noticed that with uh, our trajectory, you know, the 5.3 that we were previously has gone up to 6%. Um, for that and we do some sort of to work to see how we can reduce that. Yeah, so, so we have seen uh, our long term sickness is, is going down, we see short term sickness, and um, we know we tend to see a spike in incident sickness at this, uh, at this time. And some of the direct trips that have been doing really well uh, have slightly gone up. Uh, there is some types of work that's been done in terms of managing that short term sickness. Uh, that we expect that to uh, to come down. But this is a period of time where we tend to have a bit, bit, bit of, it, of, of a bleep in terms of, in terms of sickness. Certainly, there is more work that's been done around supporting individuals in terms of the, the, the well-being offer uh, to the colleagues and, and being able to listen to some of their challenges really to reduce short-term sickness. Mm. That's a question from um, is it is there a correlation between the sickness and vaccination uptake in terms of the vaccine? Um, yeah, we we do have uh, a lot of take in terms of flu vaccination, uh, but in terms of the trend that we've seen over, over the years, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say there's a direct uh, relationship because in in other sectors, for example, in the acute sector, we still see a spike in sickness around around this time. Um, so I think the trend is more or less the same. I'm, I'm not sure whether there's ever been a correlation between mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. If there are no further questions, we will move on to the Guardian Set Working Quarterly Report.